I'm fine. I think you're ready? Yes. I'm good. Are you ready? Looks like I am. Hello. Hi. Where do I look? <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Okay. Yes. Hello. Hi. Are you ready? Uh, yeah, I think so. Hi, my name is Fumbi. I am 30 something years old, but deep down inside, I am 29 years old. I live in Lagos and I am a social media manager and I like food. My name is Nora Wolowo. Um, I am a visual storyteller. Yeah, that covers everything I do. Uh, Ruth Kwete, I'm an actor, producer, writer from Cameroon, born and raised Cameroon. My name is Gloria Okpanachi. I was born and brought up in Zaria. I'm a graduate of Air Force Institute of Technology, Kaduna, studied purchasing and supply. Um, I'm into catering. Um, hi, my name is Lucas. Oluwole Lucas, right? And uh, I'm the firstborn of five. Like, but my parents are like, okay. I'm a family of five, you know, you know, three kids, mom and dad. And I'm a graduate of National Film Institute in Jos. I'm a cinematographer. And yeah, that's me. My name is Amanda Oru. I'm from Abia State, Nigeria the first out of six children, a graduate of microbiology, now an actor. My name is Fatima Benta Gimse. I'm a writer, producer, and director. Yes. <laughs> I grew up in Lagos. Yeah, I grew up in Lagos. Growing up was interesting. I grew up with my grandma, and I'm an only child. So that's the word, interesting. Like growing up was, we are carefree. There's no problem. Everything's sorted. Unlike now that we have to pay bills. And where the church people, like my family, um, are core Christians, and my mother especially, liked um, going to church. So we are, we're always at every church program we had, um, from vigils to revivals to so every church program, Bible study. Growing up was fun, you know. Well, so. I enjoyed it because I was first born, so you know, my dad and my mom basically spelled me, you know, I had everything I basically wanted. Until my younger ones came and then, you know, they took my shine. But yeah, growing up was fun. It was fun. Five alive. So yeah, that was what used to come my mind, like all of us then, five alive. We always drink five alive in my family like a lot. Growing up for me was not that easy. I learned a lot of things very fast. I started staying on my own at a very tender age. Like, I was very young when I lost both parents. And having younger ones to look after, it was not easy because I have to figure out everything about myself alone. Going to school was hard, but in everything, I just had to figure it out by myself that I eat, I wear clothes, I do anything. I just have to, I'm responsible for everything. Growing up for me was actually fun. And okay, so for a while I was an only child and then I always had to go to my cousin's house for holiday just to spend more time with kids my age. And I really enjoyed that. And every time I would have to go back home, I was always sad because I had nobody to play with. 
but I also come from a very loving and supportive family. My dad is like my hero, so growing up was, was great. Growing up for me wasn't fun, as a truth, because my dad was too strict. He believed in so much discipline, like go to school, read your books, go to church, come back home, read your books. It was just one-way traffic. And I did not really like my dad when I was growing up because he didn't allow us to play and have fun. But, <laughs> but now I love him. And now that I'm grown and more exposed, yeah, better. Growing up for me was interesting. It was, I had a normal childhood. Um, though when I went to school or boarding school, I could see that I didn't have as much as other kids did. But that was not really, never really a problem for me because um, what I had kind of felt normal and what other kids had felt like extra. <laughs> so um, when I go back home, yes, it, it's going to be fine. And when I go back to school, it's going to it's gonna be like, why don't I have that? Why don't I have this? And it, I kind of felt lacking. I remember having a conversation with my mom. I was like, why, why don't I have it? My mom was like, well, because we don't have it to give you. So that was, I think, one of the first times I actually had like a little reality check on like whatever I was dealing with. There's a bigger world outside kind of. And then I started having like some little insecurities because I wasn't the rich kid. I wasn't the, pre the prettiest kid. I was such a tomboy, it was terrible. I, I don't think I owned dresses growing up. Um, so I started having my little insecurities. I didn't even know who I was, my identity and stuff. So it was, <laughs> it, it was a little, I think I'll say a learning curve for me. Uh, hey. You know, this is the first time I'm actually <laughs> thinking about it like that. It was, a, it was a little bit of a curve for me. Was, it was interesting. I feel like it's a therapy session. <laughs> I think I started noticing um, signs of depression when I was in my first year in university. Um, that was about six years ago. Yeah, literally. Um... Sorry, guys. Um, I think the major sign for me was um, withdrawal. Like, um, I just wanted to be alone. Um, I was not talking to anybody. I was not talking to like family, friends. I was staying with my aunt um, in the kitty den. Like, I was just angry with everything around me. I think like that was like one of those four things. Like, I was always like looking for opportunities to leave the house just to be alone or something, yeah. So those were like my early signs that I can remember for me. So I started noticing the, like the signs, two parts. First part was I was 10 years old. But before 10, I already had like, well, I say moodiness, <laughs> huge moodiness. Like I was extremely moody for a while. But when I was 10, I think that was my first, even though that was, it was never clinically like diagnosed. But I think that was my first hit. Because 10 to 11 was extremely lonely for me. And I think that was my first taste of the word depression. But clinically, I was 17. And the first sign for me was this sense of extreme loneliness in everything. And like I mentioned, I grew up as an only child. So I was technically used to being alone and by myself, even though I had people around me. But at 17, that was when I went to uni for the first time, out of the country and out of the continent, basically. So I was alone. And I was thrown into a foreign land with people I didn't even know. So I had my first taste of depression. And it was loneliness, it started with crippling loneliness, where I didn't feel like doing anything. Like, I didn't feel like going anywhere. When I'm people, I'm just eager to go back inside and just stay in. And it was, I know it sounds dramatic, but just staying in the darkness kind of thing where you just turn off the lights and you're just under the covers. Now I can laugh at it, obviously, but then it wasn't funny. 
But yeah, that was the first sign, loneliness, like crippling loneliness. Everything just felt dark for some reason. It just felt like it was constantly night. <laughs> Even in the morning, it felt like it was night. That's the best way I can describe it. Um, I would say 2018, but I did not understand what I was feeling. I just felt like I was just being sad, you know, and I'll get over it. 2019, 2020, and then 2021 was the worst hit for me. It, yeah, 2021 was when everything just went sour. I noticed that I wasn't happy being around people. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I always lock myself in my room and nothing was interesting anymore. Then we entered 2021 and it became worse. I noticed that I was hating myself and it was growing stronger every day. I didn't like my body, I didn't like myself, I didn't like anything about me. I didn't know that it was depression per se until like after. Okay, so 2016, July, I lost uh, my, I lost my, my, my family, you know, like I lost my mom, I lost my dad and my younger ones, you know. So the 05 I left in and the 2016, uh, yeah, so I, depression, uh, it was, I didn't, I just knew that I was just like, I was just useless that whole period, like, you know. When I, when I found out about the accident, about what has happened, I, I knew that two months passed and then I was, like, I, I couldn't just, I, I couldn't account for like two months of my life because it was like a blip. I didn't know, I was just, I was just like in a fixed position and then I was just there. You know, I, I didn't. I didn't even know that I was depressed. I was just useless. I was just, I was just alive, but there was no. I wasn't me. There was no purpose. There was. I didn't even know who I was. I didn't even know my name. Like for like the first month after the accident, because I was literally alone. And. Okay, so um, it was people that were like that told me that oh, or oh, that really gave it like a term. Then I I didn't really know. I didn't really know. Like I never experienced depression. I had never been around. I just always see it and I always hear about it. But like I didn't even know I was depressed until people started telling me that oh fuck, hey, you you you're depressed. You you've not left your bed in days. You've not. Eating, you've not had your bath. I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that I, were, that I was supposed to do any of those stuff. I was just alive, but I didn't know who I was or who I was at that point. So I guess, yeah, that was when, yeah. I think in 2017, 2018, because in 2016, I was diagnosed with a chronic illness and I couldn't just wrap my head around it because it was something that shook me because it changed my, um, the quality of life. I used to be a very bubbly and happy person. So learning that I had a chronic illness, that I didn't have a cure and I had to manage it all through my life just threw me off. So I think from, yes, from 2017, 2018, when my symptoms started getting worse, I just grew sadder. And I would like, I became this person that everyone was worried about taking care of. Oh, we can't live right alone at home. We can't, imagine if you've already gotten your independence, you've moved out of your parents' house, you're living alone, and then this illness comes, and then people are worried about you. And them being so worried about me also added to my depression because I was like, I'm causing so much fuss and trouble. People can't go about their lives without thinking, oh, it's going to be okay, can we live alone? So I started getting so sad. 
people would have wanted that opportunity that I had. I was working on this show that was at your chair, which was like eight months long. People would have been very like, you're privileged, you got that. Cameroonians, would, they would have not had the opportunity yet to branch out like that. But that was the first time I felt really, really alone. So the first, the first couple of months that I got here, I was actually homeless at one point. I remember I was staying with this girl and she said, I don't know, once she was like, oh yeah, come stay with me. Okay, you have this job, that's fine. Come stay with me till you're done. And I go with her and all of a sudden, I remember I go to church one morning and I see a text and she's like, yeah, my husband's coming back. I don't want him to see that I was living with somebody, so you gotta go. I'm like, Okay, go to where? <laughs> go. And so I'm in church. I get that message, I'm in church, and I just start bawling because this was the second place I was staying at. The first place it fell through because the person had moved out of the country. This was the second place I was staying at. I had no plan C. Like, and I, stuck, I just burst out crying in church. And poor pastor, he thought it was the Holy Spirit. Like, he didn't know. So he came and he came and held my hands and prayed with me. And he was like, okay, Holy Spirit was moving, but bro, I was homeless. I didn't know how to go after this. Crying. Moments I don't want to like relieve again. Lots of crying for no reason. Like I know one day I started laughing at myself in the middle of crying. I was like, why are you crying? Like I was asking myself like, why are you crying? Where is this coming from? And, I didn't know it was just piled up, repressed emotions. It was lots of crying, lots of feeling like you're in this, I don't know how to describe it, like everywhere is just foggy. Like I just casually say, oh, my brain is foggy because it feels that way. It just feels foggy. And your mood is just like this. I know they call it a word, anhedonia, one big word, where you lose the pleasure of, like you lose the feeling of things that used to bring you pleasure. And that was that for a while, because I knew things I really enjoyed doing. I knew things that made me laugh and all of that. But there was this constant, nothing brings me joy. Nothing makes me happy. That's, and they actually say that's how you know you're really depressed, where you can do it before and after with your feelings. That, oh, this thing makes me so excited. No, it doesn't. So yeah, 2019 was really big on that, but I'll just be crying. Like, and nobody around me knows, because I don't want anybody to start panicking. Or, cause even me, I can't even explain why I'm crying. Yeah, so um, last year... <laughs> last year was crazy, because, to be honest, um, at some point, I could not even pinpoint what was going on. And I think the only thing I remembered was I was just angry. Like, I was literally angry. Like, and it came from like a place of, oh, number one, non-fulfillment. I just felt like I was not having like the satisfaction that I wanted. And I was drinking, like I was drinking every other day, drinking wine, drinking beer, mixing things. Like I was literally trying any new thing I, I find myself or find my hands on. The lowest point in, in my life would be the day that, the first day I had the episode where I couldn't speak and I couldn't move my right side. I was so scared because I was in a, in a park with my friend and my boyfriend and I had been feeling down and we're just hanging out. And next thing, I couldn't speak. I tried to form the words, I couldn't speak. And then I was, it was as if I was going to pass out. Like I was awake, but I saw myself drifting off. And as they rushed me to the hospital, they had to keep tapping me and keep saying, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake, because I was drifting off. It was so scary, because I was like, in my mind, I'm like, what the hell is going on? Why can't I speak? I have the words in my head, but I can't say it. So like, I was crying, but I couldn't make a sound. That was the lowest, the actual lowest point. I felt so bad, I felt help helpless, like, Literally, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't, there was nothing I could do. And um, that was also, that was the beginning of my journey to um, getting help from the psychiatrist and the psychologist and using my meds. 
that particular incident was, yes, definitely the worst point. Definitely. I wasn't smiling anymore. And I didn't even know that. Because my mind, I just felt oh, was this burst of happiness everywhere I went. And someone was like, you don't even smile. And I was like, oh, I didn't know. I'll try. Then the major one was I wasn't taking pictures. Even till now, I still struggle with taking pictures. You know. <laughs> But for a while, I, I wasn't taking pictures. I just couldn't, I don't know, I couldn't stare at myself for some reason. Like, I wasn't taking pictures. I go out with friends and I just don't want to be remembered in that event. It was, and then it was not intentional. I didn't just know why I was doing it, but I just knew I didn't want pictures. I didn't want memories of anything. Like, even now, I think of when I was 19, I can't even remember when I was 19. I didn't save any memory. And I, I hate it. Because I, I, ha like, I have regrets. I'm like, why? You could have just taken one, even if it's just one mirror picture. I try to overcompensate now by trying hard, even though it's hard. But yeah, the two major ones were I wasn't really smiling and I wasn't taking pictures. And why I used smiling was because I was always smiling. I was always the high-pitched whatever. <laughs> then I wasn't for a while. Yeah. I've been on, at that point where I almost committed suicide. That was in the year 2020, July 23rd, precisely. Um, it was not more about the relationship. It was more about everything that was happening. Because as a lady, at a point, you want to be loved. You want to give love and you want to be loved in return. Apart from relationship, I have, you have family problems, you have your career, you have everything you want to put in place. And then some guy would just come randomly. A guy came to my life and he, I opened up to him and said, this is it. I don't care if you're saying I'm being desperate. This is it. If you're not in ready for any serious relationship, then you just back off. I was open to him because at that point, I needed love because I would say to an extent, I lack love while growing up. Like most time, I just try to find a way to make myself happy. So at that point, I opened up to you if you know you were not serious, you should have told me. But he went on and said, oh, he's serious. Like, we had plans. So at the end of the day, July 23rd, that very day, I closed from work. I went back home. He actually traveled to Lagos. And then he called me and said, no, this relationship cannot work. And I was just like, what? I've given my all to that relationship. I've try to i just went to buy sniper i bought sniper actually i kept it with me i thought of so many things at that point nothing matters to me anymore previous before that time my pastor called me and asked me gloria i saw something about you and just I've been thinking about it because a lot of things were not going right about me a lot, a lot of things were not just moving on in my life. So I was already thinking that maybe I should just kill myself, but I don't know how. Coupled with the fact that I had a neighbor before that time, she drank sniper and I scolded her. So I could not come to terms that I was also going through such thing that I came to that point whereby the only option left for me was, let me just end it. So a day to my birthday, I decided to take my life. And <laughs> what shocked me the most was, I didn't even care how I, I would make my family feel, or my mom, my dad, my siblings, my friends. I did not care. It was, it con the, the thoughts consumed me and I was ready. I, I got the poison. It was just, I was just looking at it, like, enough is enough, I'm done. 
I, I'm, I'm tired of this life. I don't, I, even, I, I don't even know what I'm living for. I don't even know. I don't even know where I'm going to. I felt so clueless. I hated God. I was in pain. You know. <laughs> it was my younger sister, Abigail, who came in and, and, and saw me. And, and that was how I, I can go through with the, the, the suicide. I was completely exhausted. I felt like a waste. I felt like I still live with my parents. It's not, it's not, it's not bad living with my parents, but having them look at me every day and I, I feel like I'm wasting my life. I feel like maybe it's just me, but I, I feel like they, they're, they're looking at me and like, this is not where she's meant to be. She's meant to have achieved so much more. She's meant to be here or there. So I feel I felt like I was a disappointment to them, to myself. I felt like a laughing stock to my extended family. So at that point, everything just came, came like a flood and it just overwhelmed me like, I am done, I don't care. Let me just go, maybe when I go, everybody will be happy, you know, and I'll be happy too. And I'll be like, okay, I'll just have peace and the silence, silence, because sometimes my head just, oh. Yeah, I was, I was ready, and, and and I wasn't sorry. I wasn't, I wasn't sorry that I was gonna do it. I didn't care your reaction. I didn't care about anybody. I just wanted to have peace. I just wanted to just have peace and just leave this world. I wouldn't say I, ha I got to the point where I had suicidal thoughts or I tried to harm myself, but I had moments where I would say, it, it would just be better if I just sleep and not wake up. And I didn't even realize how sad I was until the doctors told me that I had something called um, inorganic mood disorder, that um, most patients who are diagnosed with chronic illnesses become sad and depressed, and there's the shock of the diagnosis, then there's the acceptance stage, then there's the like, oh my God, what is really happening? And so I have bouts of, since then I've had bouts of like extreme sadness, and then I'm okay, and then I don't want to speak to anyone, I just want to be in the dark. So it's, yeah, so it's been a couple of years uh, that I have been uh, dealing with that. That was a little that was a little curve for me because I thought things were going to be better and stuff because I was working. I had a gig that was like this long money was coming in, but it wasn't it wasn't what I, as much as I thought. So there's going to be times where it's just not working. Like there was a time I didn't have I couldn't reach. Hmm. There's a little bit of pride in me where I think my dad told me that, the times where I, w I didn't have food, I would not have food to eat. I had, um, I had Gary. I don't take sugar, I don't do sugar, so I had literally Gary in my house. And that would be, it. oh, I had some beans that my mom had signed one time, so there'll be beans in my house, or sometimes I'm gonna eat like beans for a week, because I can't tell anybody nothing. And my house is by the water. So this is like months in now, and I've been on Gary for a while. And my house is by the water, so I remember walking to the water. I remember walking to the water 
and there's a little dike by the water. So as I'm walking, one of the one of the guys by the water, he says, um, don't go too don't go too close, it's dangerous. And in my mind I'm like, so what? So I walk in and I sit there. I sit on the dike and my feet, my feet are hanging down and I'm looking at the water and the waves are heavy and it's just hitting and it's hitting and it's hitting and it's hitting. And I'm like, I'm like, what's the point? I'm looking at it, I'm like, it's gonna be so easy if I just jump in because it's gonna be quick, it's gonna be fast. I'm analyzing everything. I'm like, the waves are strong. Is hitting against a hard surface. So if I fall in the air, the waves are just gonna hit me and I'm gonna go easy. And it's gonna be quick. So I'm looking at it. I promise it's enticing. And then one of the guys is like, what are you doing there? So I kind of come back to myself and I'm thinking that, okay, I can't do this to my mother because my mom has lost a child. My sister passed in Nigeria. So that one was easier to get closure she, was, she passed in the hospital. But me, if I disappear, that's gonna be, that's gonna be more trauma. I said, like, okay, and then I come back home. I turn around and I walk back to my house. And I'm like, but this is still not where I wanna, where I wanna be, where I wanna do. I didn't know what I was going through. I just knew that I just, I just didn't wanna deal with it anymore. So um, it was one of those days, and we had like a production meeting for a production we supposed to work on. And it was happening in my house. And to be honest, throughout that day, I'd, I drank before the, the, um, that day. And my mind was not actually more ready, but we paid, so we need to get the job done. And we were done with the production meeting, started drinking. And yeah, that was it. I feel like I'd already made up my mind like that morning that I was done with living. And fortunately, we had a production meeting that same day. And my head, I'm just going to like kill myself for like second day. Like I already had so much planned. And again, I just think that if I kill myself, maybe Maybe she probably will be the first person to find out. Maybe if she tries calling me second day and I don't pick my call, she'll be wondering what's going on. But again, on the other thought, I'm like, nobody will know in the house. Like, oh, this person has done something stupid because sometimes I'm not always around. Like, I just mapped everything out and I drank, Sha. I was like quite drunk. Like, I just, I was, I was just drinking and I was supposed to escort her opened the gate for her and she was supposed to go out. And small thing, small hug, small hug. I just started crying and um, literally just started having conversation, talking about how like I was done with life, um, like done with everything, like I was done, done, like and all the conversations she was telling me that point was coming to my ear like this person is quite selfish. Like why? Even I'm not even going to lie, she was crying too. I was crying and this person was crying too. And saying, um, I'm here for you, don't do this, don't do that. Like both of us were just crying. Then I got upstairs and I transferred like except like maybe the ones in my domiciliary account, like I have access to her that I could not transfer. Like, I transferred, like, every cobble I had. And I was like, from my, like, my account, I just transferred it to her account. And I was like, oh, give my junior sister this one. I'm very sure that she'll not spend the money anyhow. Give so so person this money, do this, do that. Take this one for yourself. And, like, I was, I, I think she was calling and I was not picking. I can't remember, but to be honest, at that point, anything everybody could see at that moment was never going to work. I don't know what happened. I, I drank again after sending all of those things. Kept my phone on do not disturb because I like putting my phone on do not disturb a lot. And I think I slept off. 
that was what happened that night that I could not do anything stupid. I slept off and the person that woke me up that morning was this person that I sent money to knocking on my door. I was naked. I was like, well, who's, who's that my dear? What's going on? I'm like, you did something. You sent money to me. Blah, 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 blah. And like, it was that morning like we had like a very long conversation. And I feel like that conversation was like what well, actually just like changed like my perspective about a lot of things. See you now. So yeah, like I don't think I've actually ever taken that much step to actually kill myself like I did that I Like imagine like sending like all my money into somebody's account. Like okay, give this person this amount, give this social person this amount, do this with this one. Okay, these are like my car keys or something, something, something. You know where to find them in case anything happens, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so like that period, like I was not thinking about anything else. I was just done. Like everybody was like secondary to me. I was telling her if anything happens to me today, to be honest, if they call you for work, you go, you move on. Everybody will move on, to be honest. So. Why are you being selfish? I asked that question. I was like, why are you being selfish? Why do you want me here? So, like, a lot of people don't know this, you know, because, like, I don't talk about, I, it's not, I don't know, it's not, it's not a news you really like, it's not a news you really got, to, it's not something you really want to share with people, because, like it's, it's the way people, you know, look at you, you know, you start getting some kind of treatment that you probably don't deserve or something. So So yeah, um yeah, suicidal thoughts several times. The the first week when I found out about like Okay, so because when the accident happened, like I was just asking, is anybody alive? Does anybody survive? You know, because I was really hopeful that at least, okay, even, even if it's one person, so that I'm not like completely alone, you know. But so like after that time, like the I I I just wanted to like die too. Like I was, it got, it got to a point. I I remember I was praying that God should probably just take my life because I was I didn't know how to go about you know killing myself. I had, I had like my friends around me, so there was really no chance to even say okay, or, you know, like probably take a sniper or hang myself or go and drown somewhere. I couldn't even move. I was in my room for like the whole period, but I was. But I remember I was just praying that she just died so man. So that I can just I can just go and be with like my, my brother and my sister. You know, so several times. And then when I went to Jaws, when I went to school, it was during the crisis. So it felt like a perfect, you know, like a perfect avenue to finally end it all, you know, just, you know, at least now if I if I if I kill myself now, probably people would probably think it was the crisis there. You know, probably people came to my house and killed me, you know. It was the perfect excuse to like do it, you know, but so like I guess my mom I guess like I don't know, I don't I don't know if I believe in this whole spirit thing, you know, and all that, but something happened that day, like you know. Like, like a voice in my head, you know, just like, like took me out of that space of, you know, suicide. And do do. It just reminded me that if 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 I do this now, it should just be a waste. <laughs> you know, to just be like a waste of like. The whole generation just gone, you know. So like, I guess like I was just, you know, probably I was paid for a reason. Who knows, whatever selfish reason that was, you know. 
the thought of oh, uh, they can't, these people can't just die in vain, you know. You have to. Just have to, just have to move, man. You just have to. You can't just end this yet, you know. Yeah. Those were like the significant period that I really felt like. Aside the regular thoughts, you know, time to time, the thoughts might probably just, you know, pass through my mind, you know. It's just one of those things I probably just listen to music, call my friends, you know, go out, try and shake it up. But, you know, that period in Joss was really the first time that I, like, that I really thought about it, that I really wanted to do it. Like, like, I couldn't even tell anybody, like, you know. Okay, so suicidal thoughts crossed my mind, but not in a self-harm way. Thankfully, I never got to a place where I wanted to self-harm. Like, thankfully. And that's another... I, this is very funny because it puts you in a place where you want to dismiss your struggle because you feel, oh, that means it's not that serious. Like, if I never got to that stage where I want to, like, cut or anything, that means my, my case is not that serious. But it looks different on everyone. But I never got there. I did have suicidal ideations in the sense of, oh, wouldn't it be awful to do this? Like, you go somewhere and you're having, like, intrusive thoughts and... I don't know how to explain it. It's like you go to a tall building and you're like, hmm, this looks cool. Like when you start my doing like, hmm. And like all those memes where you're like widening your eyes and you're like, hmm. -hmm. Like, okay, step away from me. This thing, even though you know you're not going to do it. Because again, intrusive thoughts are called intrusive for a reason. But yeah, <clears throat> thankfully, it never got that bad, I guess. Uh, my, my, at my lowest, my major triggers, physical and mental stress. I, I don't know if this would sound like a cliche or ridiculous, but I'll say my age. When I think about my age, and I'll also say comparison to, they will always say don't compare yourself to others. Everybody, you know, runs their race. Everybody's destiny is different, blah, blah, blah. But the truth is, one way or the other, you just find yourself doing it because we all have ambition, we all have vision, goals, things that I would want to have accomplished that I'm not even close to. My major triggers were betrayers. Betrayers. And then... Not being able when I'm, when I get too excited about something, too expectant about something, and then it does not come forth, I get frustrated in the midst of it. And sometimes the truth is social media. To be honest, it's not that I'm sitting in front of my camera. Like, family members were my triggers. And now I live alone, like I literally had to leave them. I think I was just sad and I could not pinpoint, like, aside from just my family triggers, I was also feeling unfulfilled, like there was no satisfaction from work. I was just doing it because I did not want to be alone or I did not want to, like, stay indoors or something. I wanted to push something out. That was why I was working then. But there was no satisfaction from what I was doing. So it just felt weird. I was just doing it, oh, I needed to pay my rent, but I needed to pay one bill or the other. Abuse not not just towards me, but towards other people. When I see that, because I always try to, I always try to fix stuff. I always try to fix stuff, and when I find myself in a position where I can't fix it, then that will put me in a spiral almost. I don't really have a thought-out answer because I'm still not sure. But I know for when I was 17, what triggered was being like a fish out of water. Like I moved without, I moved out of excitement. So I didn't think it through. I didn't have like any plan. I just did something 
out of excitement and reality setting. And I was thrown into this dark space and it was lonely because nobody else was, nobody else. I know we all think, oh, no, everybody understands, me, but nobody really can feel that thing of feeling. So that was very depressing. <laughs> yes, I was clinically diagnosed um, of depression. It was, um, the technical term was a kind of mood disorder and it's tied to my illness. So when I got diagnosed of the illness, of the chronic condition itself, they weren't looking at my mental health then. But then I had a flare up one time and I couldn't speak and I couldn't walk. And then they did a series of MRI, they did MRI tests, I had an EEG, and some other physical examination, and they couldn't, there was nothing physically refusing me from walking and speaking. There was nothing they could find. So they had to refer me to psych, and psych was like, you are very depressed, and that is why you can't walk, and that's why you can't speak. And when I started, so, they referred me to a psychologist and a psychiatrist. So the psychologist prescribed some meds and then the psychiatrist, I, have ses I had sessions with the psychiatrist and speaking to them and getting on the meds really helped me. It's not that I don't get sad or I still don't get worried or upset about my condition, but the drugs I'm on, they help to balance me out. So I'll give you an example. So the particular drug I use, I'm on a very high dose of that drug. If I miss it, if I miss a dose one day, two days, I'm okay. By the third day, if I don't use it, my mood is like, I want to break something. I feel rage, I feel anger. So I try as much as possible not to miss my medication. I've considered seeking professional help because I made inquiry with one person but the price was too high, so I've considered it because I think it will really help because mentally, I don't think I'm 100% fine. I don't think so, so I've considered it. So, uh, I don't know how I feel about that. I don't, I don't think I, I don't, you know. I don't think that I don't think I want to keep having talks like you know talk to someone about it. I don't. I don't know. I'm indifferent about this the whole therapy thing. You know. I know. I know it works for like you know. I know it works for like people and all that, but I'm not just. I'm not just a big fan of you know, therapy or try to seek professional help, you know. Because me, like, I feel like I'm fine. Like, if I wasn't probably sharing this right now, you know, I'd be fine. I'd... I try as possible not to really dwell on it until when there's, like, like, you know, like a reason for the whole emotions to come back, for that whole feeling to come back, well, you know, yeah, I'm fine. I don't know. I'm not sure I've, you know, probably when, if, he, if he's serious, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if this is, like, serious, but, I'm not just a fan of therapy. I don't. I'm, I don't vibe to it like that. So yeah. I'm not sure. I'm. I don't, I don't know. Maybe later in the future when I'm, you know, when I'm, you know, like a big boss and shit. I don't know. But right now, I don't know. I'm just indifferent about it. This is, I think this is my first, if my mom watches this stupid shit. <laughs> but yes, I was 18 and I was the uni counsellor. Because my friends were like, you have to talk to someone, you can't, this is... I was like the wet blanket in the friendship group. Like, I was the only friend that would just be looking so moody when everybody's having fun. And they're like, you have to talk to someone, you can't keep being this person. Like, we can't take you, we can't take you anywhere. So I was like, okay, I'll talk to the guy. And he brought it up and I was like, no, that's not me. Wrong person, wrong diagnosis, like, what? Because I had that, um, no shade to Nigerians, but I had that Nigerian mentality of, I can't be depressed, like, I can't be. Like, I'm a young girl, I'm, I'm 18. I don't have bills to pay, I don't have responsibilities. What is depressing me? Like, there's nothing heavy. But then I just dealt with loss. 
So I think that was piling up. But yeah, I was 18. Um, somebody had to, like a very close person had to like, um, um, pay for a therapy session for me. So like, that was when I was um, diagnosed and said, oh, I have like um, depression and also a functional alcoholic. Um, professional help. But um, again, I like being honest, but again, it's money. So maybe when I work and make some money, I would do that. But for now, I would just manage myself the best that I can and surround myself with a lot of love. So it just keeps me going. Yeah. Uh, I was never clinically diagnosed. I'm scared. Hmm. You know when you're afraid of what you might find? So, there's a lot of baggage in me. There's a lot of shit I've been through in my life, and I don't think I'm ready to deal with everything I, right now. So, I've literally made a couple of appointments with a, with a doctor, and then I've canceled it. I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm completely ready to deal with stuff. That's just a fact. Maybe, maybe later. <sighs> Procrastination, but okay. How would I rate the Nigerian mental health case? system. Okay, let me just give you a scenario that answers your question. My therapist told me to try not to fall sick too much so that my boyfriend's family and even my boyfriend don't get tired and then um, so he wouldn't dump me. That's what the therapist that I don't know that is supposed to help me. That's what she said to me. And that's one of the reasons why I've stopped therapy in Nigeria. I'm never going to get therapy in Nigeria. The beds the psychiatrists have given me, they work for me. I told my, um, the doctors last week, they said, oh, why are you not seeing the, why are you not going to psych for your appointment? I said, because I don't like them. They are desensitized. Your case is not the worst case they've seen. So compassion is not, it's, they are like robots. Compassion is not something that comes easily to them. And then the people that show compassion project their own personal issues. Like I knew that my therapist has been married for so many years and she has not gotten a baby and is stressing her. Why is that my business? In a session that's supposed to be about my own mental health, about making me feel better. She's telling me about her own problems. So like, it's, it's another, like, you can do five seasons of the problem of Nigerian healthcare system. Like, we won't live today. I can start from when I was diagnosed. They don't, they don't care. And also, let me just say this, that I think part of the problem is the fact that they are not compensated well enough and they are owed a lot of, uh, they are owed salaries for months. So it's like a vicious cycle. The patient suffers for what the system is doing to the doctors. So I can say that if you knew how the system was, so you could have chosen another profession or gone to another country, because at the end of the day, you should put patients first. Sometimes this, I'm telling you that my psychiatrist, sometimes they would just, it's just like robotic answers. Are you okay? On a scale of one to 10, how do you feel today? Any suicidal thoughts? Okay, and keep using your drugs. Go and see the psychologist. The healthcare system, with, for mental health, they themselves need therapy. That's how bad it is. Another thing is when you find therapists, make sure they're actually good for you because some therapy is actually awful <laughs> and we don't admit that because they're scarce. So I think anyone we find, we just hold on to them. No, some therapists are actually very awful. Take like two sessions and know that, read the room and be like, yeah, I can't continue with this person. This person is not treating me like a person, they're just treating me like a science experiment, or they're talking to me anyhow. You're paying for it. It's not free. But yeah, you really have to see someone. So the worst part of being depressed is missing out on life. There's been moments when I've not been able to get out of bed for a week to a month. 
If you ask me what's going on, I can't tell you why I'm there. I'm just not motivated to do anything. Like sometimes I wouldn't even eat because it's just like too much stress. I'm like, okay, just gonna lay here, have water or juice. And I'm just gonna stay and miss out on work, places, people, interactions, relationships, just it's just it's just a lot. Something depression has taken away from me. Not sure. I know when I say like, okay, I use the age 19, for example, I'll say like cherishing memories made me scared of doing things. Like I missed out on a lot of outings with friends at some point. Cause I was just, cause I also had like symptoms like anxiety. So I was just scared of everything for some reason. So I missed out on a lot. I feel like I have lost a part of me that I'm never going to get back. And I am okay with it because I'm a totally different person. And the version of myself before depression is totally different. And I miss her sometimes. But I've gotten, last year, 2020, uh, 2021, I think I got to the point where I accepted this new version of myself. And the part that has, that depression has eaten or taken away from me, I let her go because I mean, I still want to enjoy my life and I don't want to dwell on what I've lost. Uh, so right now I try not to think about that, but it took me, imagine since 2016, since 2016, it took me how many years, 2021 to get to that point of like, okay, yes, depression has taken this, my chronic illness has taken this away from me, but you have to move on and find other ways to enjoy this new version of myself. And I like this new version of myself. It's like full B 2.0. I love her. Yeah. I, I believe there were, there were signs where I, I, I actually tried to cry for help. But because of the person that I am, when I'm out there, I am bubbly and, you know, very sociable, people love to be around me. They don't really seem to get the tiny, tiny, tiny clue that I give them, you know, and I don't blame them. So, but sometimes I, I notice that I could be around you now and you say, hi Amanda, how are you? And before you, before I could say anything, I start to cry. And then you, you start to wonder, why is she crying? But because I, I don't want to start talking about it, having to explain, because they might not even understand. I just say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, sorry. You know, I try to just cover it up and move on. I always wish people notice things, <laughs> but I can't help it. I think everyone has something that, it's funny, I know everyone has something they're like dealing with in their own lives. So I can't really like throw myself out there and be like, hi, I'm dying. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, of course, you always want people to notice you're down. You want people to be like, something is off. But again, you can't help it. They don't. Nah, nobody should be where I was last year. I don't recommend it. Like, like, I literally could not think straight. <sighs> and I was going to work and people were thinking that, like, everything was fine. I remember somebody called to for me, like, one of the projects where, like, oh, Nora has been in our best mood, like, in the previous week, and literally I was struggling with my life, like, in those times, yeah. Again, you don't know what people are going through. Just be kind. Anything like you are doing in this life. 
Like, just be kind in anything you're doing. People are, people frustrate you, people do. But just be kind because people are going through shit. Like, and you're not the only one. And what I've also learned is like, not transferring aggression on people because as much as I'm going through something, I don't know what this person I'm transferring aggression to is also going through. Yeah, be kind. Worst advice I've gotten is say, okay, dress up, we're going to the club. Because after, after you go drink and drown your sorrows and everything, it's not really drowning though. Well, it's kind of drowning because they'll, you find yourself choking again on it. Because the next day, you're now dealing with the feeling of depression and a hangover. So yeah, that's, that's been the worst advice I've gotten ever. I have been able to to confide um, in my family and a few of my friends, and they were really heartbroken. One said to me, if you had succeeded in taking your life, I would have lived in regret because I would have felt like I wasn't there for you. And that broke me. I said to myself, why would I put them through that, blaming themselves for what I did, you know. And thankfully, the, the few people that I have, you know, shared this with, they were very supportive. And instead of judging me, they showed me love. I sound cliche, but I think filmmaking has helped me the most, you know. Because considering the fact that filmmaking really saved my life, you know, because I didn't go on journey because I had you know, like a film run to do for Adiola, and, you know, and thank Adiola to save my life, I guess. Because if I wasn't working for her, I probably, you know, <laughs> filmmaking, then my friends, man. <sighs> you know, let's just, like, you know, in this occasion, it's not about family, because, you know, you know, family is just, you know, family is just messed up. You know, I had more of my guys, people that, you know, that I didn't probably even know, like, from small. That I probably met along the way in my life. Some from, like, high school, you know. But all these guys were just really around me then, you know. With, like, they were just with me throughout, like, two, four, seven. If I open my eyes, I'm seeing one person, you know. If I close my eyes and I wake up again, there's somebody else beside me. There's, there's just always, like, people around me. Good guys, not just any other person. Like, people that really cared about me, people that, you know, that wanted me to be fine, you know. You know, it was, yeah, my my friends and film really helped me. If I knew what I know now, I wouldn't have gone to that point. The truth is, um, I've always been very strong, but at some point, the situations that have been compiling in your heart, just, it's just drown you and it keeps draining you and then you just break down at some point. But I would say I'm a bit over it right now. And with what I know now, I will always speak up when necessary. I will always talk about it. If you have loved ones going through dark times, try not to be dismissive. It's so easy to write it off. It's so easy to compare, because there's this annoying behavior. If we're not dismissing people, we're trying to say, oh, my own is worse. Oh, like I'm the like the most depressed person. Like it's not a competition. Ask questions. Sometimes people just want you to ask questions. Like they can't. Like they know you can't help. You can't fix it. You're not a professional unless you're a professional, like licensed therapist. But don't be dismissive. Ask questions. React with kindness. I know it's not about you. Like most people. And I think I don't know if it's an African thing. I can only speak from like for where I'm from. Like, as an African and a Nigerian, we are very, like, sensitive to people being dark. 
So if someone is saying like, oh, I feel very depressed to do it, oh my God, like, it feels like a, like a personal attack. When it's not really about you, the person is just saying how they are feeling. They didn't say, you made me depressed. They're just saying, I feel depressed today. Oh, I woke up feeling moody. We just need to give people space to be also. Like, let them express themselves and not make it about us. So yeah, don't be dismissive. Ask questions, it's not about you. React to kindness and yeah, the basic, the basic things we should know but we forget. Okay, so, um, yes and no, you know, because, so after that whole episode in just, you know, even before then I already knew that, yo, I had to just, I had to just move, then I drowned in myself in film, you know, like the third month, like after the first two months that I was like, I believe the third month I was out of the house, I was already working, I was calling people for like production, I want to work, just, I want to be on set. I want to, you know, I want to, you know, not like distracted, but I really just wanted to take my mind off that and just channel my energy into something else that would, that would help me, you know. So, so yeah, you know, like, film really helped, you know. So, I just channeled all my energy, all my aid, all my loss, all my pain, all my everything. I just, you know, I just shouted it to like film. I was just everywhere. I was always going on set. I was working with everybody, you know. And then um, my friends, great, great guys, great support system, you know. So, you know, those guys, all that, all that activities, all that process, and my friends really helped me move. Not like move on per se, but at least help me get to like a comfortable mental space that, you know, like, my depression is, it, like, how, how I put it? it, it's not, like, the, like, it's not like, Probably because I couldn't get something, or that's what I'm depressed, or I couldn't achieve this, or because I wanted to have this, or because I needed this kind of money, or, you know, you know it's like that loss is just like every day to tomorrow, like every time I do something, anytime anything. <laughs> you know, anytime anything good or bad happens in my life, it just, it just is a whole, you know rush of memory that, you know, I could probably be sharing this with my family right now. Or the day I graduated from school. <laughs> you know? You know, I would have, you know, all this, like, I'm, I'm good, but, you know, I still have, like, this whole episode sometimes, but, I don't know, I guess I'm a good shot. So yes or no, yes, because I'm, I've been able to like, you know, move, not like move on, but I've been able to like evolve over time, you know. I know how to like handle myself when I'm, you know, about to start feeling some kind of way. I know because I still, I don't, I don't genuinely or naturally feel like I can ever get over, you know, the feeling because in the future, even when I'm old, if I have my kids and they do something very interesting, I might, you know, still have that whole, you know, emotional shit. But yeah, I'm good. I'll be forget all these tears. I'll be a strong guy. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. My life has turned around because um, I don't allow the certain things to weigh me down. Whenever I'm a bit moody, I just call someone, talk to the person, tell the person, this is what is wrong with me. This is what I'm going through. And after one or two talk, I feel okay, I feel better. And I just keep moving 
knowing fully well that someday everything will fall in place. So, from the depression, I feel like I, I still, I feel like I've just been able to uh, manage my, um, my state of mind now than it was last year. But I really don't think I've gotten out of it. Like, I've just been able to say, okay, because of a very long conversation, I, like, that thing actually has to be the weirdest thing. Like, I had a very long conversation that lasted over almost more than an hour, and that literally just changed, like, my perspective about a lot of things. And even better than my therapists. So, yeah. I don't think I've come out of it, but I just feel like I've been able to manage, like, oh, everybody has their own problem. So I feel like that was my first mindset. Even the person I was going to meet and saying, um, oh, we're always having a conversation about, oh, how do you feel now? Do you need anything? Blah, 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 blah. My mindset was just also, oh, this person also have their problem. Like, you can't just be clouding this person with your problems. So, like, that was, like, one of those things that um, has also just helped me manage like how I felt or how I've just like my my mind has been since then. So now I literally don't want to cloud anybody with my problems. Like, please solve this thing alone. I, I, I wouldn't say that I have, you know, an advice for anyone because I'm not even there yet, and I'm still trying to find myself trying to find answers, trying to heal. So, but I think I'll just say one thing. Don't be alone. Just, if you can find someone, if it's just one person that you could talk to, do that. Because I think I was alone for too long or I bottled everything up for too long. That's why I believe that's why, you know, mine went, that, you know, that, that far. So I would say, just find one person that you tr that you trust to an extent that you can share everything with and hope, hope that they help. Or if you can, see um, a doctor, you know, yeah. But any advice for me? Nah, I still define myself. <laughs> Even though we make fun of people that say, oh, take a walk, or drink water or do like it actually helps to clear your head. I learned that in 2020 when we're all like stuck in the house. And as much as I love being indoors, I realized stepping out actually clears your head. Like seeing the world around you, staying grounded, it actually helps. It's not just yoga terms and everything, it really helps. There's this feeling you will have to just be by yourself, to just wallow in self-pity and wallow in your pain and a lot of what ifs, why me, is it my village people? I, my advice would be to speak to those that are near and dear to you. I know some people would make you feel terrible. They'll make you, uh uh, but it's not showing on your body now. You don't look sick. You get comments like that. You have to have a support system. If there has to be one person you are comfortable speaking with, if you have like parents or or siblings that don't understand, you should have at least a friend, one person. Just look for the one person. Having someone to talk to, having someone to lean on is a huge, makes a huge difference. I don't think it was even just one advice because as I've been saying, I think it was like a very, very long conversation. I think the conversation was different from the previous one we've been having. So the previous one was like a more comforting conversation like, oh, don't do this, I'm here for you. This one just felt like this person was like truthful and probably just at that point understood like the pain I was feeling and was like, if you kill yourself now, understand. Like, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to um, like, like um, do like, maybe be hot or something, but because now I know and all of those things. Before, the conversation has always been like, don't do this, don't do that. But that one was just like, the whole like, um, conversation was just different. <sighs> one year from now, mentally, I would like to have dealt with what I'm still avoiding to deal with. So I can be stronger and 
because I'm not saying that um, things are not going to happen that will probably trigger me, but I want to be able to be armed with how to deal with it without it interrupting my life. Because I need to be, I'm planning to have a family and to raise these people, so I need to be stable in the head <laughs> before bringing other people into my wahala. Yeah. Don't worry, I'm going to see it. I'm going to actually see a doctor. Get proper everything taken care of.